Hello scientific writers. Welcome to the expert scientific writing techniques course. I'm your instructor, Dr. Brian Waters. I think you're going to enjoy this one. Uh, I really like scientific writing and I really like thinking about how to make sentences and paragraphs better. And by better, I mean more concise, more consistent, more coherent, uh, making them flow well, looking for cohesion, all of these kinds of things that makes good scientific writing at the sentence and paragraph level. So let's get started on this course. This is the first lesson, which is basically an introduction to the course. So I would like to start with some recent headlines from the scientific press. For example, I have a headline here from Nature News. This headline says, science is getting harder to read. This was from September 2020. Uh, the, the subheading here, from obscure acronyms to unnecessary jargon, research papers are increasingly impenetrable, even for scientists. And I have a little excerpt from the paper down below. Science is becoming more difficult to understand due to the sheer number of acronyms, long sentences, and impenetrable jargon in academic writing. Not only does such overcomplicated language alienate non-scientists and the media, it can also make life difficult for junior researchers and those transitioning to new fields. Your scientific writing is often talked about as bad writing. Uh, it doesn't have to be, and there's a lot of really good scientific writing out there, but there's also a lot of bad scientific writing. And so this headline is telling us that the bad scientific writing is becoming more and more commonplace. It's becoming more prevalent. And so we're going to look at ways that you can make your scientific writing fall on the good side, not on the bad side. This is a quote that I really like. This is from Steven Pinker. And he says, Why should a profession that trades in words and dedicates itself to the transmission of knowledge so often turn out prose that is turgid, soggy, wooden, bloated, clumsy, obscure, unpleasant to read, and impossible to understand? Well, that's a great question, Dr. Pinker. Why, why do we turn out that kind of prose? In his book, he talks a lot about the reasons why. And I think the more important thing is not really understanding why. In this course, I'm going to tell you how. How to not do that. How to turn out prose that is clear, crisp, lively, concise, smooth, unambiguous, pleasant to read, and easy to understand. That's the place I want to get you to after taking this course. So why does it matter? You know, why don't we just publish our, our work or submit our grant proposals and, you know, let the readers worry about interpreting it and figuring out what we're trying to say? You know, why should you try to make your work clear, crisp, concise, pleasant to read, all of that that we just talked about. So let's talk about some reasons why. Well, here's another quote I would like to show you from Dr. Randy Olson in his book called Houston, We Have a Narrative. And he says, poor communicators are able to say the same basic things as good communicators. They just need a, a lot more time and space in which to do it, which ends up boring everyone. Let's look at some more headlines. In the New York Times, uh, they highlighted this article that was published in the Proceedings of the Royal Society, Section B, Biological Sciences. And this was from April 2021. Uh, the New York Times headline says, Are you confused by scientific jargon? So are scientists. Scientific papers containing lots of specialized terminology are less likely to be cited by other researchers. And so this New York Times article is about the journal article, which we see the, the title below here. It says, specialized terminology reduces the number of citations of scientific papers. So some scientists actually did a study on this topic, looking at characteristics for what makes papers cited more or cited less. And they found that using a lot of jargon and fancy words that are hard to understand decreases citations. So if your papers are being cited less, they're having less of an impact in the world, in your field, and in society. And if you're writing a grant proposal and you're using terminology that's hard to understand, 
the reviewers are less likely to get excited about your proposal and support it in the panel session where the decisions are made. Let's look at another headline. This is a press release from the Columbia Business School. Researchers there that did a study, and they found that people who lack status are more likely to use jargon to compensate for their insecurities. And I've highlighted the quote here. It says, jargon is like a suit, a car, or a watch. It's a status symbol. Those who are insecure dress up their words, believing it will make them appear smarter or cause others to take them more seriously. However, they found that people that are secure in their high status actually use less jargon, fewer acronyms, and less legalese. In, the, in, this, in this case, we could say scientific ease in our case. Um, and these high status people prioritize clear communication rather than concerning themselves with status or public perception. Another headline. This is from the Association for Psychological Science. Alienating the Audience, How Abbreviations Hamper Scientific Communication. It says abbreviations are mentally taxing on a reader and can incidentally alienate an audience. By simply replacing abbreviations with the words that they stand for, we greatly improve our communication. The authors go on to say, let's consider making our writing more open and easily accessible. Yeah, that's important if you want your work to have impact. Here's another one. This is also from 2017. The readability of scientific texts is decreasing over time. They looked at over 700,000 abstracts published from 1881 until 2015 in 123 different scientific journals. And they measured the readability of these articles. And they found that Readability is, has been decreasing over time. They say that these results are concerning for scientists and for the wider public as they impact both the reproducibility and accessibility of research findings. So again, if people can't read your work, uh, if it's too much work for them, they're just going to throw it aside. They're not going to finish reading it. If they don't finish reading it, they're less likely to cite your work. They're less likely to fund your grant application. And your work is not going to have the impact that it could otherwise. So it's really important to make your writing easy for the reader. You know, that's my top priority when I'm a writer, is to make it easy for my reader to understand what I'm saying and to make it easy for them to read quickly through my sentences, through my paragraphs. All right, one more headline for you. This is from Science um, and it, this was from April 2021. And they say, do you want other scientists to cite you? Then drop the jargon. Okay, so we're, we're looking at this jargon study again that the New York Times talked about. You know, this coverage of it highlights a few different things that I just wanted to show you some quotes from this article. So at the beginning of his career, Alejandro Martinez peppered his papers with fancy words, he says, because that's what others in his field did and he thought it would impress his colleagues. But he continued, his work wasn't getting cited. I was really not getting the impact that I was expecting, he says. And he has since changed course and now makes a point of framing his research so that it will interest a broader audience, a strategy that forces him to cut down on jargon. And so now his papers are getting cited more because he's writing them in a more accessible way that's more reader friendly. So I think these headlines give you some answers to the question, why does it matter? Why bother making your writing readable? Number one, so you don't bore your readers. Number two, so you don't confuse your readers. Number three, so you don't appear insecure. Fourthly, so you don't alienate readers and limit your audience. And together, these points are going to increase the impact of your work if you write it more clearly. And that will also decrease your rejection rate. And the flip side of that is increasing your acceptance rate. So I think those are all positive benefits of making the effort to make your writing better. All right, here's a quote from William Llewellyn. He was a, a journal editor for many years. And in one of his advice columns, he says this, I do not believe it is possible for one person to teach another person how to write. All right, so you might be scratching your head and saying, if that's the case, 
why are we doing a scientific writing course? If Brian, if you can't teach me how to write, why am I taking your course? Well, this is not the entire quote. There's a little bit more that I didn't show you yet. So let's take a look at the rest of it. One person can teach another about writing, but the only way to learn how to write is to write. Now, the reason I'm showing you this is because I want you to be aware of this fact that you have to put in the work to learn this material. You know, I can show you examples. You can understand those examples. I can tell you all kinds of things and you can say, yeah, that makes sense. But if you don't go out and put it into practice, it's not going to stick. So I'm going to teach you about all of these writing techniques, but it's when you start putting them into practice that you will learn those techniques. So let's look at this writing improvement cycle. If you took my course on how to write your scientific journal article, then you've seen this slide before. I came up with this concept after teaching scientific writing at the university level for several semesters. And I was really reflecting on you know, how students were learning scientific writing. And this is what I came up with. It starts with awareness. The awareness is put into practice and then you get feedback on your practice, which gives you additional awareness. And then you do more practice, get more feedback. And this is a cycle that's a virtuous cycle. It's going to improve your abilities every time you go through this cycle. And so in this course, what I'm going to give you is the awareness part of the equation. It's up to you to do the practice and then to find some feedback. So you can get feedback from your, your lab mates, your colleagues at work, or uh, you can hire a consultant that will give you feedback. And you can get feedback yourself because once you've gained awareness, then you can, can evaluate your own writing using the principles that we talk about. And so this writing improvement cycle applies to reading, it applies to writing, and it applies to editing. All of these parts of the writing process are, are going to be improved as you gain awareness and put it into practice. Now, let me talk about my goal as an instructor. My goal is to help you write your scientific text in the most readable, clear, and concise way possible. Breaking that goal down into objectives. First, I want to help you become aware of good scientific writing at the sentence and paragraph levels. That's what this course is about. I'm going to provide you with specific examples to illustrate good scientific writing and not so good scientific writing. Uh, these examples are going to come from the literature. They're going to be real examples. Sometimes there are sentences that I just verbatim uh, put into the slides that I'm going to show you. Sometimes I've edited them so that they're not identifiable or that they're shorter so that the, the mistake shows up more clearly. And sometimes I took a good sentence and made it into a bad sentence by intentionally making mistakes for the purposes of illustrating those mistakes. All right, objective number three, I will help you know how to give a paper a high degree of readability. And objective four is overall, I want you to help you become a better scientific writer and thinker. Writing and thinking go hand in hand. You can't write without thinking. And as you write, you're going to refine your thinking. So this is another kind of, of cycle. You know, the thinking is some of that feedback I was talking about in the, in the writing improvement cycle. Let's take a look at the course structure. So this course is going to be in um, eight different lessons. We're in lesson one right now, the introduction to the course. Lesson number two is coherent sentences in the English language. Um, in this lesson, we're going to review parts of speech and some basic grammar that uh, you need to bring up to the forefront of your mind. You've probably learned it before, uh, but we'll look at it one more time. Lesson number three is technical writing fundamentals. So the title of this lesson is technical writing. What's it all about? So we're going to step back and look at scientific writing as a, as a subgenre of technical writing. Lesson four is readability. How do you define readability and how do you achieve it? Lesson five is on structuring your sentences and paragraphs for impact. Lesson number six 
is on word choice. So this is words and punctuation with a punch. So how to make your writing really impactful and powerful. Lesson number seven is keep your reader by writing with clarity. Uh, the opposite of that is if you're writing without clarity, your reader is going to put your paper down or put your grant proposal down and stop reading it. And we don't want that. We want to keep the reader. Um, and lesson number eight, keep your reader awake and alert by being concise. So that's what this course is going to look like. So each lesson is going to have a video component. And in this video, I'm going to show you a lot of real examples. But then I'm also going to have some worksheets for you where you can work on real examples of scientific writing. And each lesson will also have a quiz. So if you pass all the quizzes, then you will have completed the course successfully and you will earn a certificate. Now let's talk about how to do well in this course. Uh, the first one's pretty obvious, do all of the lessons. But the important part there is to practice. So don't just watch the videos, get out the worksheets, work on those. And then after you've done the worksheet and you've done the quiz, practice. Now how do you do that? Grab your stack of papers and start looking at them. Look for good sentences, uh, look for mistakes that writers might be making. So that goes along with point number two, to think and reflect. So we're not just going to do the lessons and move on, but you need to really start thinking about how can I recognize these mistakes? Why are they being made? And how can I avoid them in my writing or correct them in my writing? Item number three, put effort into implementing the lessons. So effort is important. I emphasized that earlier. I'd like to reiterate it here again. Write every day. I really recommend having a daily writing practice. I think that's an important thing of being a prolific and productive scientific writer is to have a daily practice, you know, build it into a habit. Take your time with the lessons. Okay, so I don't want you to sit down and watch everything in one day. You need to do it week by week and really develop your skills with each lesson before you move on to the next lesson. And finally, I want you to have fun. I mean, for me, this is the most fun part of scientific writing is the revising and editing and making my sentences and paragraphs look really nice. That's what I love to do. So have fun with it. You know, if you can't have fun, then I'd say at least enjoy the challenge. So that's the introduction to the course. I think you're going to enjoy it. I know I will. So you're ready to move on to the next lesson. And in the meantime, happy writing.